When we want to get a bipolar transistor biased in the forward active region, or we want to get a MOSFET biased in the saturation region, we often use resistors and capacitors to design our amplifiers. We use resistors to establish the right voltages at the base collector and emitter, or at the gate source and drain. But did you know that we can also use inductors instead? Look at this example. An inductor's been used to connect the power supply to the collector. In this video, we're going to see why this might be advantageous sometimes. First of all, let's take a look at a traditional resistively biased circuit. And I wanna point out some drawbacks that we can perhaps improve upon if we use inductors. First of all, what's the gain? Well, we can identify this as a common emitter configuration. If we label our load voltage over here, then we ought to be able to write the gain almost by inspection. We have an input impedance of R1 in parallel with R2. We also have some impedance looking down the emitter, but because we don't have any capacitor down here, I'm going to just neglect it. We thus have a voltage divider at the input side. Now for our gain, it's definitely going to be negative because we have an inverting configuration here. And you might remember that one way to express the gain for a common emitter amplifier is simply all the resistances attached to the collector divided by all the resistances attached to the emitter. I'm going to use that expression for our discussion here. So we have these two resistors in the numerator, and then we just have a single resistor, R sub e, in the denominator. I now want to consider what happens if we increase the value of R sub c. We might want to do that, for example, if we want to increase the gain. If we increase R sub c, then it's in the numerator of this expression. So the ratio of the load voltage to the signal voltage is going to get higher. So we conclude immediately, ah, increase RC if you want to increase the gain. But is there any danger in doing that? You might recall that we have to be very careful about the DC bias point. As we increase R sub C, then the collector voltage is going to start to fall. It falls because we have a fixed power supply voltage and a DC current going through that collector resistor. The expression for VC is the power supply voltage minus ICRC. You see what the danger is, right? If we start to increase RC in an attempt to increase our gain down here, then we're going to cause our collector voltage to drop. How low can it go before we have a problem? Well, I like to think of the base voltage as a danger point. If the collector voltage starts to get close to the base voltage, then we anticipate a problem of saturation. In fact, it can drop a little bit more than that. If you look at the data sheet of a transistor, it will tell you what the minimum collector to emitter voltage can be before our transistor reaches the saturation point. If I label this point in the circuit V sub E, then I can say that VC should not, and indeed cannot, drop below VE plus VCE sat. This means that there's a limit to how much you can increase R sub C. If you increase R sub C in an attempt to increase your gain, you might drive the transistor in saturation. Let me show you that replacing this collector resistor with an inductor can help you out a little bit. This is called inductive biasing. And I wanna start off by thinking about what the DC collector voltage ought to be. Do you remember something about an inductor? If you flow DC current through an inductor, then eventually the voltage on both sides of the inductor will be the same. Inductors somehow impede AC currents, but DC currents can go right through them. That's why inductors are used, for example, in low-pass filters. They're very good at passing low frequencies, and they're very good at passing DC currents. What that means is that in our circuit, the DC collector voltage is exactly our power supply voltage. They're equal to one another. 
we've somehow managed to achieve the highest possible collector voltage by using an inductor. Now, how is that different than just connecting the collector directly to the power supply? Couldn't we have used just a wire? Well, there's a problem if we use just a wire. You might recall that in an amplifier like this common emitter amplifier, we're dealing with AC voltages. Let's see how the AC signal will flow through the circuit. Well, we have an AC signal over here in front of resistor R sub S. We'll have a little bit of a voltage drop right here. At this point, we have a DC offset. That signal goes into our emitter. And then the signal is flipped upside down and it winds up here at our collector. Can the AC signal go through that inductor? It cannot because hopefully I've chosen a large enough inductor that it will block it. On the other hand, our DC signal or our DC current is not blocked at all. This is really important because if I were to just use a wire there instead of an inductor, our AC signal would see an AC ground and we would wind up with a gain of zero. But here, because we've used an inductor, the AC signal is not able to escape up to that power supply, which is just an AC ground. Instead, our AC signal goes fully into our load resistor. There's no current divider here. There's no AC voltage drop across a collector resistor because there is no collector resistor. The inductor is like an open circuit as far as that AC signal is concerned. Therefore, I expect that using an inductor will increase our gain. Let's see what the expression for the gain looks like. If we label our load voltage here as V sub L, then let's find the ratio of our load voltage to our signal voltage. I'm again going to ignore the resistance looking into the base of this transistor. And we just have a simple voltage divider set up by the signal resistance and the two bias resistors at the base. Now, how about the expression for the gain? We should again find all of the resistors attached to the collector and divide them by all of the resistors attached to the emitter. All of the resistors attached to the collector amount to just R sub L. The inductor, as far as this AC analysis is concerned, behaves like a current source and current sources are like open circuits. So we just have RL here, and we just have RE down here. Because there's nothing in parallel with R sub L, it's almost like current source biasing. The only deficiency or the only thing wrong with using inductors is that inductors are bulky, expensive, and they have some parasitics that are sometimes undesirable. But using inductors to do biasing can have some advantages from time to time. We've saved a resistor and we've improved our signal swing and we've improved our gain. Let me tell you about signal swing. And I wanna think about the voltage right here. Whatever voltage we have at the collector, of course, is going to be inverted and hopefully amplified from our voltage at the source. The midpoint of that signal is going to be our power supply voltage. And this is a little bit weird, and that's why I wanted to point this out to you. It's not often the case that voltages down here in the circuit would be higher than the voltages up here. You know I like to write the high voltages at the top and the low voltages at the bottom. But in this case, there's no way getting around it. The inductor allows the voltage here at the collector to temporarily exceed the power supply voltage. So whatever the gain of the circuit is, it is possible that the amplitude of the signal will cause the collector voltage to shoot up higher than the power supply voltage. What's the limit on the downward swing? Well, the limit at this point is again, the emitter voltage plus the CE saturation voltage of the transistor. That's how low it can go before you would start to see some kind of clipping in the signal. This signal swing between the power supply voltage and the saturation point tends to be larger here with inductive biasing than we're ever able to achieve using resistive biasing. That's one of the advantages here. 
Let me show you another configuration that's really quite typical. In this example, the load resistor has been coupled through a transformer to the primary side. First of all, let's talk about the DC currents. Well, we're going to have a particular DC bias point here, which will lead to a particular DC bias point here and a particular DC current flowing through the emitter. Where does the DC current flow? Well, all of it flows through the primary side of that transformer. But because it's DC, absolutely none of it will make it over to the secondary side of that transformer. That means that our load will see a purely AC load automatically when we use this kind of transformer coupling. Something that you have to be sure about when you're designing this kind of circuit is that the primary side of your transformer can handle your DC bias current. A lot of transformers don't like to have DC currents going into their primaries, but if you use this kind of configuration, then you have to watch for it. Now let's talk about the AC characteristics of this circuit. We'll have some small signal entering the amplifier. That signal might be attenuated a little bit across the source resistance right here. The AC signal will show up at the emitter. It will then show up inverted at the collector of this transistor. But what resistance or what effective collector resistance does the signal see? Imagine now a transformer with N1 turns on the primary side, and we'll say it's coupled to a secondary that has N2 turns. We've studied this kind of AC coupling before. It's a very common setup for impedance matching. The question now is, given the turns ratio N1 and N2, what does that load resistance look like from the primary side? The formula is actually really simple. The ratio of the resistance seen on the primary to the resistance on the secondary is just the turns ratio squared. This means that R reflected is some ratio times the load resistance. Let's now think about the gain, the overall gain for this amplifier. Let's label this voltage V sub L. So for this circuit, we'll have a voltage divider set up by the input impedance and our source impedance. Now for our gain, we need to think about the resistances attached to the collector divided by the resistances attached to the emitter. What resistance should we use here at the collector? Well, we better use the reflected resistance because that's the primary side. That's the resistance seen from the primary. So it's just going to be R reflected here. And then we have it attached to R sub E. I have one final point to make about this circuit and we have to make a small correction to our expression for the gain. And that's because here at the load resistor, you could have either side labeled as positive and negative. I could flip the polarity, for example, and have this side be positive. But because of the way I actually have it labeled, I'm going to have to multiply this times negative one just to flip the polarity at the output. Of course, because it's a purely AC signal across the load, and because it's isolated, you could then feed it to a circuit with either side reference to the positive side. You just have to keep track of which one is in phase and which one is out of phase with respect to your source. One of the most common uses of having a transformer there as part of your bias network is in audio amplifiers. It's nice to have a purely AC signal going through a speaker and the fact that it's transformer coupled here prevents any DC offset from going through a speaker and perhaps burning it out if something else in the circuit fails. You'll often see audio amplifiers set up this way, so that's why I wanted to introduce to you the concept of inductive biasing.